All right. Yeah. So um, I don't know if the other one will join later or. But since you are here, you, it's better to stay. Yeah, as I didn't know the time, I said, let me just join and see. <laughs> yeah. That's no hey. problem. Yeah, they should join you. Yeah. Should we wait for them or we... Now we can start, but let me tell them that. Okay. Send them. Okay. Yep. So I emailed them. Let's see. We can start. No problem. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you once again. And um, so we'll go quickly through the uh, the questions that we have. So. Um, yeah, so the first question, we would like you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what, what is your interest and the current work that you are focusing on now. Okay, so my name is Kai Zonder. I work at the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement Summit based in Mexico. But most of my work is in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And I'm an agronomist originally and I'm the head of the GIS unit, so Geographical Information Systems at Summit. And I work in a group that works on foresight targeting and ex-ante impact assessment. So we are part of the social economics program and we basically look, we try to look ahead to see what might be coming in terms of opportunities and threats for cropping systems, in our case, maize and wheat-based cropping systems. And try to look, could be climate change, could be diseases, could be other things, yeah. Could be new markets for maize in some part of the world where it's not being grown or different type of wheat. And so we use crop modeling a lot in that, in that sense to see yeah, what might change in terms of, of, of yields, of income for farmers in 20, 30 years. And um, you may have heard that breeding is a very slow, process sometimes it can take 10 15 years till a new variety gets to the farmers actually yeah mm -hmm. so if you're looking at how to address let's say new stresses more droughts more heat stress then it's good to know what's coming and we try to guide our colleagues in the breeding program and one of the tools we use for that a lot is, is crop modeling which is one of the few maybe the only way to look at we know more or less from the uh, climate change models what's going to happen in terms of climate in the future. And so a crop model is one of the few ways to actually calculate and compare productivity at the moment with our current weather or in the past with the predicted climate in the future. That's why we have a lot of interest on different perspectives. That's more or less what I'm doing at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, welcome to the other speakers. Uh, Diego and Machu, we are so privileged to have you. So we were asking uh, Kai to introduce himself and tell us a bit what he is currently doing. And so I don't, maybe you can also go ahead and just let us know uh, quickly. Diego, you want to go first? Okay. Uh, so I'm a wheat crop modeler. Uh, here working in CIMIT. Uh, I have started to to work here in CIMIT in 2017. And we have conducted some works, uh, especially uh, with application of crop modeling, for example, for climate change impact, assessment, uh, adaptation strategies, also uh, trade, trade adaptation, uh, to, to try to help the the breeders and the and all the agronomic system uh, advice of of CIMIT to uh, to use to use best the resources to to predict what what is going to happen in, in each environment and why and in, in understand the 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 importance of different traits in different environments so the interaction of G by E by M and 
also with uh, work with uh, many uh, GIS uh, tools to run uh, the crop models that were designed to run in a point-based, in a gridded uh, scale. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we we engage with all, all many uh, initiatives like the AgMIP. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about the the AgMIP. And uh, it's a multi-model intercomparison and improvement project. And we also engage with uh, many like uh, top uh, scientists, crop modeler scientists and University of Florida and also in people in, in Australia and, and other uh, and scientists from many parts of the world to get uh, to work together in, in different projects. So that's that's what I'm I'm doing. Okay, thank you. Annabel, would you like to? Uh, we're introducing our activities. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for letting us this, giving us this opportunity to um, to speak um, about the activities our modeling community of practice is doing. So our community of practice is engaged uh, very much. Uh, we want to kind of fill the gap that. Uh, nowadays exist there are many gaps in crop modeling so we try to to work uh, towards filling as much gaps as possible and one big gap is about knowledge sharing so we are trying to we do different activities for sharing knowledge among crop uh, crop modeling experts and people interested uh, we are we organize a lot of webinars uh, sessions uh, we are active writing reviews book chapters and other Application. So this is a very important part of from our community of practice um, knowledge sharing. Um, we, for example, Diego um, and Kai are also working nowadays to fill the gap between experimentalists and crop models. So in terms of the data uh, crop models need. So crop models need a lot of data, as you all know, for, for being able to work properly. But experimentalists, people who are collecting data, Sometimes either they don't have the time or they don't have the resources to get so many data, so much of the data required for modeling. So um, Diego and Kai are working towards like minimum data requirements um, that uh, it will be easier for, for um, people collecting data to collect. And also, for example, probably promoting remote sensing uh, as a tool for collecting data <clears throat> and other techniques. Um, we are also working, um, okay, let, let me think, <laughs> because we are working in many different projects. Also, we have some uh, mini grant projects that, um, unfortunately, our budget is not uh, big enough to offer more mini grants, but this, uh, some of the mini grants which are going on are also doing like key things for, for crop modeling activities. Uh, for example, we have the IWIN project that they are trying to to get a huge and a very vast uh, dat database from CIMIT and they try to improve the data that is contained in, 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 within this, uh, in this database and to make it more um, <clears throat> inter interoperable and to make it more complete because some data was missing. And so I think basically that's uh, our main activities. Um, so basically, yeah, working towards the gaps in, in, in crop modeling try to find solutions, try to open a conversation and try to keep people engaged and establish collaborations and learning about like our modeling. And uh, let me just introduce myself then. So I'm the, um, I lead the wheat physiology group at CIMIT and as and a couple of uh, international have been setting up a couple of international collaborative uh, partnerships. One is the International Wheat Yield Partnership, um, and the other is the Heat and Drought Weed Improvement Consortium. So those keep me busy, but I, I did agree to lead the, the community of practice in crop modeling. Uh, that was a request from our director general initially, not because I'm an expert in modeling, because I'm certainly not, but more because of the, the contacts that they've developed over the years and uh, some people say that um, I can be an honest broker because I don't use models. So I don't have uh, a bias one way or the other. 
well, I don't use simulation models. Obviously, we always use models in, in uh, plant research. So if you guys have questions. Well, hello, my name is Menen Ibrahim. Uh, I'm 25 years old. Uh, I'm a PhD student specializing in crop protection, particularly in uh, nematology. I would like to start by saying that crop modeling is central uh, to understand and improve agriculture and productivity. Uh, but what do you think are the advancements so far and the, the gaps in terms of crop modeling? Well, let me start as a non-expert non modeler um, and more as a provider of data for models. It's very clear to me that there's a big gaps in our understanding of, of the way plants work and the way they respond to diseases. And obviously we can't model as effectively things that we don't understand already. A model is a, an abstraction, a simplification of, of what we know. So if we don't know enough, the model will necessarily be also deficient and require a lot of black boxes. That doesn't mean to say we can't make some, uh, some good simulations, but there's always a margin of error and those margins of error uh, can be may not matter depending upon on what you're trying to uh, predict. So obviously oh. it would be much better if those margins can be brought down through better data sets and in particular much better um, understanding. So it's an ongoing process, it's gonna take time. Okay, uh, I want to, uh, I'm um, specializing in crop protection. So, uh, well, uh, the most obvious question for me is what are the most efficient models used in crop protection and yield prediction, if you have some ideas? That's for Diego. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let me start with that. Uh, the, the crop models, uh, the, the, when you when you are trying to choose a crop model for for some simulation, you you need to to take into account what what you are looking for. What are the variables that you want to simulate? What are the pros and cons? And what uh, in how how experienced is this crop model in your region? Because sometimes the crop model is very experienced. You have uh, calibration for a specific condition, specific location. But if you bring it to a very completely new uh, condition that the model is not experienced, so it 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 lacks a lot of uh, of uh, understanding of what what is behind of the simulations. So the model, all the models, they need calibration, they need evaluation, and and this is a long a long term pro uh, process. So it it requires uh, experience in in each situation in each environment. So that's that's the what what you need to take into account when you are choosing a crop model. So here in CIMIT, we use uh, especially DSAT models and APSIM model as well. Uh, it's the most used ones. We have others. Um, if if you go to the AgMIP uh, community, that is a uh, agricultural uh, model intercomparison and improvement uh, project. Uh, it, it takes into account and it has a lot of crop models. So it's a list of many, many for, for wheat, we have more than 40 crop models. And, and you basically, when you are uh, trying to, to choose one crop model, uh, it's, it's always better to use more than one crop model. So you can have more, uh, you can decrease the uncertainty of your, your simulations. And, and also, uh, to, to choose what, what crop model and what, what you are going to be uh, simulating, it's always good to get in contact with the experts in, in the crop model so you can have more confidence in what you are doing. So have a good uh, supervision when, when you are using crop models. Uh, also establish partnership with, with, the, with experts. Is there uh, crop models about uh, the oliver trees and uh, nematology? Um, oliver trees, uh, actually, for for trees, uh, the crop models, most of the crop models, they don't they don't simulate that because it's uh, 
I don't know. It's it's something that you have uh, an, a lack of knowledge for crop modeling in terms of uh, of trees and 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 also silvopastoral systems intercropping with uh, trees and, and plants. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. It, this is this is something I can I need to I could look for and and recommend to you. But uh, nemato, nematoids, uh, it's a disease, specific disease model. It's not a crop model itself. So it's also something that we are starting to work together to put together the, the disease and crop models to, to simulate both of them. But uh, it's specific for different uh, diseases. And there are some diseases that are still under study and not uh, in, incorporated in crop models. So. Yeah, is this your subject of your study? Yes, I'm studying the Pratinitis genus. It is a genus of nematodes on uh, olive trees. It, uh, it is the root lesion nematode that attacks the roots and it causes 30% uh, of uh, loss of yield. So we are studying its pathogenicity on uh, the different varieties of uh, uh, Oliver plants, and we are uh, trying to find some uh, methods of control uh, of this uh, pathogen, uh, mainly biological control. Okay. Yeah, we can. I can look for for that for you, if you if you want. Uh, but in the the models that we use, they don't simulate Oliver tree. So. Okay. Um, is there any limits for this crop model? Sorry. Is there any limits for these crop models? Uh, they are. They have any drawbacks? They are, They have any limits? Um, yeah, I, I would say it's like what Matthew Reynolds was was saying: the limitation of understanding. It's it's something that uh, the models need to be to keep being improved, and. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of understanding of many, many aspects, not only the crop aspect, but also the soil, uh, the soil transformations, the weather, how it interacts with the management as well. So uh, the models that we use here in CIMIT, they have more than 30 years of experience in many parts of the globe. So it's something that we can, we can trust. Uh, but of course, it has uh, limitations. It depends on what what specific process you are looking for. There are some some uh, knowledge gaps in in certain aspects. That's why the, the crop models need to to keep in under improvement. But uh, many many aspects are are already um, uh, very advanced. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I have another question here for you. Um, I think one of you uh, was mentioning that one uh, main step in using a crop model is to calibrate the model. And we know that in many developing countries, uh, uh, data is a challenge. So how do you think we as a PhD student or you know, young researcher can overcome that challenge of data, especially in the case of Africa, I say. Maybe I'll... Kai, you want to say something? You are, you are muted. You are, you are muted. Oh, sorry. So um, we had a webinar a couple of months ago I think on that topic. Um, yeah, I will. I will uh, type the link here at the webinar yeah, about, the, and about secondary data sources. Yeah, we did one together. I'm also part of the um, COP on geospatial data because obviously there's a lot of overlap. And I mean, I know what you're talking about. I worked eight years in Ethiopia and Nigeria before coming to Mexico. So that has an, always a big limitation. So you have to find a good balance. You need some uh, ground truthing and validation data from your own plots or from your own location. Ideally on the on the cultivars, let's say the, the crops grown, yeah, they may be quite different from generic ones that you often find together with the, with the crop models. And nowadays, 
there's a lot of very good open source data sources where you can get most of the, the data you need for, for uh, emulating like climate, like soils. Some of it was mentioned during this week and with the uh, advent of machine learning on those techn technologies that has improved a lot. So institutions like NASA and ESA and several universities, they offer daily rainfall and daily temperature data for almost anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, at Simit, also, we've been using that a long time in G by E analysis when we got data from, let's say, a couple of hundred stations all over the world where people were trying new varieties for wheat or maize. We were sending data back. We had yield and we had some physiology, physiological data, but we would never get uh, climate data for those locations, either because they didn't collect them or they didn't share them. And now I can go online, I can write a script, or I can use a, an app, and I can pull down daily or sub daily climate data for any crop model. So that's a huge step and same for soils. You always have to be aware that um, if you look, work in a specific point, it's always better to get your own data. Let's say do a soil analysis, uh, look a bit at the soil profile, which is often a big problem. But if you're looking at a larger area, if you want to model, uh, I don't know, let's say sorghum for Tanzania, then you can go to a web page somewhere is Rick in, in the Netherlands, for example, and you can get soil parameters and that is available for any anywhere in the world at a resolution of 250 meters. So that it's not too bad nowadays. You still have to be aware that often that is not real data. It's extrapolated. Yeah? So if you live in a country that is very mountainous, let's say Ethiopia, Rwanda, or here in Mexico, uh, you know that a couple of hundred meters can make a big difference in terms of temperature. Sometimes also in rainfall, and then you have to think a bit about that. But generally, yeah, it's easy, even in data scarce environments, to get most of what you need nowadays and for free. So not a bad basis. Okay, um, I think I attended the the webinar you were mentioning a few minutes ago, and uh, one one of the main challenge also in using um, second source data is um, the input data, for instance, rainfall data for crop models. And there are nowadays many products that are available, chips, uh, Damsat, and also new uh, generation, such as uh, the MS Web and those. But generally, these products perform well in other regions of the world, but in Africa, there are more complex uh, uh, weather formation or rainfall formation. And this led to sometimes bias in using those uh, products. How do you think we can uh, handle this, that issue of using for a satellite product? Or... Yeah, I mean, ideally you would always try to get a certain time series for a place you're working and interested in and then you calibrate. Uh, before there was CHIRPS, for example, there used to be satellite-based data set called TRMM, Tropical Rainfall Monitoring Mission. Mm -hmm. And that always had this problem because it looked at clouds and it could determine there was water in the clouds, but it didn't really know if it had rained or not. I think that has improved quite a bit nowadays. So there was always a probability that TRMM would say, oh, there was rainfall in this place, but really there was almost nothing or nothing yeah so in, in those cases you had to do like local calibrations so that's always recommendable and some data sets that you can get like uh, nasa power they do that themselves but they always get ground station data and they use it to uh, to validate and to calibrate whatever they put in the, in the final output so some of these data sets also the what isa does nowadays with aki or r5 and others they validate the models and they try to improve that. Not always perfect because NASA power is 60 kilometer resolution. So it's also not the best, obviously, yeah? but we used that for a long time as there was nothing else around. And it's one of the things that in, in a perfect world, you, you have a station everywhere and yeah. you use that data. And, but I find that, yeah, whatever we can get nowadays from remote sensing sources is, is good enough. But it's always good to, if you have a nearby weather station, download that data or get that data and, and compare it 
then you can get a good idea uh, how well it is and how useful that data can be. Okay. There is a question that I think would be interesting for all of you. Big data plays an important role today and combined with the machine learning algorithm, it offer a new perspective of crop modeling. How do you see this uh, new feed and what can be the challenge we need to address now to be effective using uh, machine learning and uh, big data in crop modeling? So one, one of the applications uh, that we are using in one, one of our projects um, is to, to have a recommendation on nitrogen application, for example. So we have, uh, we have just won the, one of the Inspire Challenge with this project. And is, is basically the combination of crop modeling and machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence on to, to, to improve the recommendation of nitrogen application. So the, the crop models they we use in, in the sense of uh, understanding if if the if the artificial intelligence and the machine learning uh, results they make sense for because it it uh, it's not gonna you you're not gonna find all the information all the data in this for to represent the system and to to feed your model then you use that information to to have the, the machine learning to tell you some of the variables. For example, in our case, the nitrogen concentration in the plant and the nitrogen proportion of the, of the compared to the other nutrients. So we have this, uh, we, we need lots of data to, to estimate that. And then from the nitrogen concentration, you go to the, to the nitrogen, the fertilizer application using the crop model because the crop model is going to simulate the whole system. So you, you simulate the, you enter your sowing date, you enter your weather data, you enter soil data, and then the model is going to tell you the, how much nitrogen is, is giving you how, uh, the, the yield expected. So it's something that it, it's one of the applications, uh, but we also had the, had the webinar have one session in the in the in, in this convention. I don't know if you have checked this. Uh, I think it was on Tuesday, Wednesday. right? Wednesday. 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 Yeah. yeah. So there is a, a lot of other applications of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning combined with crop models, uh, and many many in many cases to to use in the combination. So you're not. Uh, trying to substitute one, one and the other. You, you use both of them to, uh, to, to improve the understanding of the system. Yeah, in, um, in this session we organized Wednesday, uh, for example, Scott, uh, Scott Chapman presented some example of the use of machine learning in crop growth modeling for estimating phenology parameters such as uh, leaf area and radiation use efficiency. He also presented uh, some nice examples of how we can estimate the source of variability in space and time using some phenotyping techniques and using drones and using tractors. Um, they have to be, uh, of course, like properly equipped um, to be able to estimate crop uh, parameters such as ground cover, leaf area index, and for example, uh, you can use it for counting plants. Uh, he presented a nice example uh, from uh, imagery um, and using machine learning. That was a, a nice example Scott presented on Wednesday. Uh, for example, uh, Mark, Mark Cooper, um, he, he presented more um, about the um, like use of crop models for the interpretation of genetic basis of traits to accelerate genetic gains. Um, he showed like some advances in genomic selection, integrating a lot of K 
capabilities uh, embedded in crop growth model to enhance the prediction algorithms and also uh, to help understand more the G, like genetic by environment by uh, management crop management practice interactions. So those examples were presented and, and there are way more examples. So there is a lot of, of um, to do a lot of way to do and of course machine learning and crop modeling they are complementary so they they need each other and a lot of nice work is going on also during the inspired challenges there were a lot of very nice interactions uh, between crop modeling and machine learning for example like uh, the one that Diego just presented and uh, got an award um, so there is a, a huge potential and a lot of things going on in in this area I want to say something. Okay, I will ask uh, another question uh, about the views in the, the discussion. How satisfied are you about the event so far and how can you rate the engagement of you in the discussion? So I'm, I'm very satisfied. I think like the youth guys, you really play a very important role in this convention. You really keep like the chat moving. Uh, Twitter, so I think youth were a very important uh, key. It's for all the convention, but for this convention, guys, you had a great presence. So I think we all have to be very grateful because you engage in so many conversations. You all made amazing questions. So it's not only just about posting on Twitter, but also like asking, uh, asking the right questions. So uh, having youth like they are not only good in social media, but they are knowledgeable about the about the topic. So personally I'm very happy and I think we all are very happy with the role you guys played so you really did an amazing job like those days and so it's like what, what I can say so I hope like youth guys and especially we we need of course in crop modeling we need youth we need females there is a, a, a important uh, gender gap in crop modeling so I hope uh, Manuel that uh, you you will be a future female important crop modeler <laughs> so we and i hope that more youth and more female engage um, in crop modeling activities because there is a lot to a lot of work to do and amazing um things to explore so i hope guys that you keep engaged and that you keep um yeah engaging with us and with our community thank you very much uh i think i have i have one or one or few, yeah how do you see uh, at the end of this convention the future of agriculture and what would be your advice for a uh, young researcher as, as we? That's a big question. Um, normally would require some deep thought and a few beers probably. Um, the future of agriculture is going to be dominated by obviously by climate change. Um, it's a fact that if you look at long term, very long term climate data, if you drill into the ice, the, the polar ice sheets, we have experienced in the last 10,000 years an unusually stable period in terms of climate. And it's possible that we're going to move out. So that will have serious ramifications for civilization in general. Um, however, not to be a prophet of doom, there are technologies that even if we do have unstable climate can presumably help us to manage that. Maybe we don't want to reach 10 billion people or whatever. But um, I refer to things like uh, being able to grow, I mean, vertical agriculture and use of solar panels for example, could help us in certain very dry regions. And uh, obviously there's a lot of hope from uh, molecular technologies yet to deliver in a large part, but starting to. Um, and there's also a lot of genetic resources that have been collected, especially since the Green Revolution and during it, during the beginning period. Uh, if you look at all crops together, it's in the millions. I think it's something like seven or eight million accessions, mostly they haven't been explored. And so there's a lot of potential. Uh, the other uh, element is whether or not the human, the human race decides to modify its eating habits. 
um because we all like to have a well i'm not maybe not all of us but many of us like to have a steak um and eat a high animal uh, a, a diet for high in animal uh, products but we don't have to and these of course are are much more intensive in the terms of of land use and resource uses in general so these are all ways that agriculture will change and obviously these represent opportunities for people who have a whole career in front of them but um how you choose to pitch should de be determined by your interests of course so that's very important because most professional careers in not just in agriculture are, are demanding they're not uh, as you know already it's not it's not an eight to five kind of job it's uh, very often much longer hours than that and um, this is what we have to that's the reality of doing a, a meaningful job and so it's important that it is an area that uh, you're excited about that's what, that's what I would say. Does that help? Yeah. If, um, if I can say my opinion, I I agree with many of the things that Matthew say. Of course, I don't eat meat, but it's like <laughs> everyone has its own preferences. Um, I see the future of agriculture digital. So it has to be digital, but it has to be digital and arrive to everyone. So the future of agriculture has to be uh, the signing tools and technologies that really meet the needs of people in each area because we we have to think locally it's like not only global of course uh, like in each country in each region there are different needs so it has to be digital it has to be accessible it has to be lead for from from young people uh, who are collaborating with the eminences, with people that also have a lot of knowledge. It has to also be female <laughs> because uh, women, we have seen in this convention the, the participation of women and how women play a very important role in agriculture. And like the, the solution have to also be designed for specifically for women or it, and specifically target for, for the region and for the needs of the farmers that, that are there. And of course, if you are asking like about students, what do you have to take into account? You really have to learn to kind of engage with different actors, with people from different disciplines, because this is not only about crop modelers. We need to um, interact and we need to collaborate with very different disciplines. We have to treat, to treat the data, like the data is one of the most valuable things. We have to treat the data like gold and we have to make the data good data because if we have good data, we, we can have good models. If we have good models, we can help, uh, for example, um, designing some, um, some application to help farmers, like, for example, like uh, Diego just explained, to, to decide how much nit nitrogen, how much fertilization they, can, they have to use. So you can help them to reduce the cost. But um, yeah, of course, we have to think that we have to design different technologies. There will not be one unique solution because the needs around the world are very different. So definitely for me, um, the future of agriculture has to be digital and you guys uh, as students uh, learn as much as you can and um, engage with other people, try to collaborate because as you have seen in these inspired challenges, the key is collaboration with pub CGIR, like public uh, actors, um, start up, uh, private companies, uh, government organizations so about partnering like having an open mind and be ready for what is coming thank you any other final thoughts um, career-wise just to give you some advice you have to be very flexible if i look what i learned in university and what i'm doing now that doesn't have too much in common anymore I moved laterally several times in, let's say, 20 years of work, always ready to acquire new skills. I realize these days that I've been a data scientist for 20 years without knowing that because uh, the word didn't exist, you know, but I was doing basically what the definition is just because it was of interest and it was needed at that time. And a lot of the, the work I do or the skills I, I just learned because they were interesting to me at that time. I didn't have any formal I have no formal training in GIS or in crop modeling. 
I just I was interested in lucky for you you're in a very good time um, there's incredible amount of good information in the internet available to anybody I think we had a, an example last year a young lady from the US a high school student actually she taught herself how to use um, Google Earth Engine and she did uh, food security analysis for Ethiopia comparing where she lived I think Iowa maize production and none of that she had learned in, in high school and she was very very young but did a fantastic job with freely available tools and, and data so I think the world is quite open there and people who are interested and willing to invest some time that is very worth it and it can help you immensely in your in your later career yeah that's a great point in fact uh, when when uh, at least when Kai and I started our careers there was no uh, internet to speak of and now you can look up anything you want any time of the day almost any place on the planet well, where there's some um, civilization around anyway. And, uh, and actually then now becomes a problem of being overwhelmed by information. I agree with Annabelle that digital is a key part of the future, but um, yeah, it's also some, I think in science, like in many other fields, the pendulum swings around from one extreme to the other and can sometimes lead to imbalances and so it's important to, I think it focus is very important as well. And, and Kai, even though he's moved and, and Annabelle actually started as a chemist and he's doing a great job with uh, understanding our modeling needs. Um, it's all, when you are in a field, it's important to focus uh, because otherwise uh, one can spread oneself too thinly and not get the kind of achievements that, that are required to build a career as well. And uh, always bear in mind that the most powerful tool you have is a, is a supercomputer that is located inside your skull, your brain. Yeah. That is the most powerful piece of technology that you're gonna get in your life. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Maria has any other question before we close. No questions, but I want to thank you for the, all the information that you give us. Uh, thank you very much and good evening. Thanks to you guys. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Bye. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank uh, you. Ask us questions if you have them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to you. Bye. Yeah.